Okay, there we go. The AI uh, has effectively told us that uh, our recording has started. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. How do we want to start this? Because we haven't done this in like, I don't know, it feels like two years, but it's really only been like two months. It's probably, yeah, it's probably been just a couple months. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm down for talking about anything, man. Uh, yeah. Whatever's on your mind, or if you had any topics that you were... Well, do we want to do the like the pinion versus Hayon uh, fake fight, um, or do we want to just kind of go go about like talking about like how training's been recently? Um, the general premise of the show, <laughs> show, the general premise of the show being post training, um, and talking about what what happens after training, um, and kind of reflecting on that and lessons we've learned, friends we've made along the way. <laughs> I mean, either either one works for me. Uh, okay. I mean, Hayons are the superior version of the Katas, so I, okay. mean, I, don't, know long, All I right. don't know how long that discussion is going to be. But, <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. Um, we can we can we can just get into that. I'm that'd be basically like we've from the point of our starting recording, we can just probably grab that because one of my one of my things one of my things with, with being like, hey, let's do a streaming show. Is that hey, I don't feel like editing, so mm. uh, let's just throw it on the internet and see if people like it. Uh, there you go but is what it is is what it is so how how have things been since our last foray because i had you on the recorded podcast which took forever to get out for reasons um but since our forays from before in the summer with dan which hopefully will happen again soon um you went into the mountains and came back a new man i did yeah we went on a nice little road trip uh spent a couple of weeks out west and uh did uh uh rocky mountain national park uh, yellowstone grand tetons and uh, the badlands so a lot of time on the road and a lot of time just hiking camping climbing and being very cold out in the wilderness <laughs> in august it was chilly well while well, we were there september september right. so uh yeah it was chilly so some of the nights when we were camping i mean it was getting down to 20s so you know sleeping in your sleeping bag it's pretty chilly in Oh, there we go. Why in out of like Wyoming, Colorado? Yeah, it gets chilly. September. I, yeah, I, I've gone from uh, the nice tropical islands to having a bear as a roommate. <laughs> I'm sticking with that. I'm sticking with that story and until a later date, at least. But yeah, I've uh, moved yet again, um, and yeah. Last time we were talking, I was I was the middle of a move. You were so. getting ready to move, yeah. Well, then you were getting ready. Uh, I think you were. Last time we talked, you were getting ready to go down to Okinawa. And I know well, so you did some training, right? With uh, you got to meet up with James and, uh, and those Josh. Guys. Yeah, I, uh, James did the 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 Oso kind of thing of just being like, "Hey, your life's not going great right now. I'm gonna just take care of you for a day." Like oh, he nice. was like uber senpaiing me on that day, <laughs> which was pretty That's awesome. Uh, but I will tell the story of uh, uh, the kindness of strangers in Okinawa. So like me being the very smart person that I am, I was using my phone to find the hostel or the hotel I was staying at, which was like, mm -hmm. I'm trying to actually make sure that I can't see the chair that's behind me. But yeah, that's fine. Um, I get to see see piece of clothes on there um so i drop my phone right outside the hotel i go up to the hotel um i get in there get my stuff there i'm like okay tomorrow i'm gonna train with james looking for my phone and i'm just like ah it's somewhere around here i have all my stuff with me because i'm moving mm -hmm. looking 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 and this is after a 13 hour boat ride so gotcha. yeah Jeez. Make, Make of that what you will. So I call the phone on Skype. The one thing you can't do with Zoom, apparently. Um, and the police pick it up. And this is like not 20 minutes after I had checked into the hotel. 20 minutes after I checked into the hotel, someone found my phone on the, f on the ground and went like five blocks over and gave it to the police in Okinawa. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, well, the best well, the best part was, it was like, all right, I, I was trying to, my Japanese is okay, but it was like, all right, I know where they're talking about, and I know where that, like, is in Kensho. It's like the, where the town, where the uh, Naha city office is. I'm like, I know where that is. 
but from here to there, I have no clue how to get there. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it was just like triangulating 7-Elevens. <laughs> In, because there's there's they're like Starbucks is in 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 the states it's like they're all over the place. Um, never go to the Starbucks in Coke Side already. It's far too expensive. You like internationally like it, it's it's ripping you off. But um, I'm like triangulating these like just go down to that one and they'll tell you where the next one to go and go down to that one they'll tell you where the next one to go. And for even after 13 hours of on a boat I'm I'm just like go 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 go. So I am sprinting down the road yeah and this is uh, late august it's just dripping spraying spre <laughs> sweat everywhere oh wow and so i finally get to the police uh, this like police box and if you've ever been to japan um if anybody's ever seen a police box when you go into the police box it is literally just a box and you go in there and they and they ask like they're not even there like you have to like kind of like buzz like buzz for the police to come out uh -huh. so it feels like very like oh god like what are they hiding behind there and they both come out and they're like all right we need all your information and then what was the most important part was that i call the person who found it and said thank you hmm. you don't have to give them money they just want you to do that it's not a legal thing they just kind of it's a nice thing for you to do. Courtesy, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow, well, that's awesome. Yeah, that's 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 really amazing that someone would turn it in like that. That's not something you would probably have had happen uh, over here in the states. Um, wow. Well, and what was amazing about it is that it was like the space of time was like twenty minutes. Like you think, like if somebody had like yeah. just like how how fast that happened. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mean to get into that story, but you were you were fighting with bears. Yes, yes, we were wrestling bears. Um, had a couple go through our campsite, and uh, you know they're they're pretty chill. They didn't bother us too much. We didn't bother them. So, uh, but yeah, it was a good trip. A lot of bot, a lot of body macing, and that or like uh, not macing, but basically finding like large swaths of wood to mace around with. Yeah, so I tried to take my mace with me when I could. Uh, mostly it stayed in the car um, if we were going on super long hikes. And then, you know, I'd always find, try to find something to get my, uh, get my mace reps in when I could. Um, you know, my wife just rolls her eyes when she sees me doing that stuff, but she's supportive in her own way. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. But is it... Uh... Do you feel you need, there's like a minimum, you need to get a minimum amount in before like, oh God, no, I haven't done this in too long. No, for me, it's just, it's more of a, an, uh, uh, an obsession with getting, um, uh, I just have to move. Yeah. If I, like, if I've been sitting in the car all day, you know, driving, like, when we get to the campsite, I, I need to swing a mace or I need to do something because I, I've just been, I've been sitting, I've been sedentary. I don't do well when I've been sedentary all day. And so, you know, I try to find some way to squeeze in, whether it's a mace or I'll go run kata or something. I need to, I need to, to move my body um, or I don't feel like I've been productive for the day. Is that something you've always had, you feel, or is that something kind of the stage of life you're in now? I don't want to say later stages of life, but, um, do you feel like, was that true when you were younger or is that just, has always been the case or karate kind it's of? Yeah, it's probably, um, I think it probably came more about during the pandemic when I, when I really just sort of fell into my training even more and um, my training became, you know, sort of the second I got done with, you know, meetings for the day. I was out in the driveway with my mace. Like I, I, my mace was right next to, you know, I was working from home. My mace was next to me. And like, I just could not wait to get outside and start mm -hmm. moving. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I sort of developed an addiction. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I would say it's a healthy addiction, uh, but you know, I, I, I developed an addiction to training to where it's, it's, it's my, um, uh, it, it keeps me in check, right? It's like, it's, it, it clears my head. It's, it's, it's moving meditation for me, you know, with all the craziness that's sort of going on in the world. Like that was my way to just disconnect and, 
now I, I can't stop. So, you know, I have to, I have to do something every day. It's really, really hard for me to take a rest day. Like, mm. even if I tell myself, like, I'm going to rest, like, I'll still try and squeeze in a yoga class or I'll still try and, you know, go out in the backyard with a mace or something or run some kata in the living room or whatever. Like, I, I have to, I just, I can't not, um, you know, I should probably talk to somebody about that, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a healthy addiction. At least I, I try to justify that in my own mind anyway. I mean, no, I would say there's like, there's something to that. I mean, it's not like you are doing something dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not pushing point. myself. Yeah. I'm yeah. not pushing myself to where, you know, I'm injuring, uh, injuring myself. You know, I, I do listen to my body. So, I mean, when I get really, really, really sore, like my body tells me like, all right, dial it back and, you know, I won't go as intense or anything and, you know, running some slow cuts or, you know, yoga is kind of like recovery for me. So even on a rest day, going to a yoga class, that's not super intense. You know, that's, that's, that's usually fine, but, you know, I do try to stay aware of make sure I'm not hurting myself and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I've, uh, I don't know. I've, I've, I've kind of come and go on that where it's like, there's some, I had a very good stretch in 2018 or 2019 to, right before the pandemic hit where it was like every weekend was like 21 kilometers at least um wow. yeah and then that that kind of died um partially because it was just like afraid of like if you're out there for a long enough time like you're gonna run into somebody and when you're running you don't wear a mask yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. which was dumb like look in hindsight it's dumb but yeah it, it it was the dumbest reason to kill a really good thing for for a really yeah. good thing to die sure. um i think that's one of my biggest regrets from my reaction to the pandemic to be honest yeah. um but recently it's like my right hand has been like kind of messed up so like i don't like it's this very very faint like for example i'll be like holding a plate mm -hmm. And like it'll kind of some go in and out of like it kind of hurts, kind of doesn't hurt, kind of hurts, kind of doesn't hurt. If I don't warm it up or something, like it's n not gonna be, uh, you know, yeah, which is weird because it's not like I don't know if that's like neurological or I don't know. I probably I don't know. Um, I have been because of moving, which was like. When we had finished uh, recording our last podcast, I was literally frantically making Frankenstein boxes for 48 hours. Wow. It was very fun, but also very like, you know how you get in this like mode where it's like, I need to do this. Oh, I need to do this. I need to do this. And you're, your mind's going in three different directions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then it's like, yeah, we'll put that thing on top of that other thing. And then we'll, we'll wrap 17 boxes around it in five minutes and then just use duct tape. And then it's an hour later and you're still holding the, the tape in your hand and you don't know what happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know if it's like weird injury from that or what whatnot, but it's it's I feel the more I I'm working on it. That all to say yesterday I had eight hours of comma training. How does now what does eight hours of comma training look like? Does that, does that farming like cutting the grass? Okay, yes. so you're out there cutting cutting grass. Awesome. Yes. So it was uh where I where I live now, which I will not disclose, but uh where I live now, they have a tradition of kind of thatching roofs with okay. like straw and stuff. <clears throat> so uh they you know, after a week of like basically not training because I've got you know new jobs and stuff and so Mm -hmm. you know figuring out time zones and, and things like that yeah I mean, it's like kind of crushes training but it was like yesterday i was like yeah training it's gonna what what's gonna happen common training all day yeah i'm gonna do my kata so i'm doing the, like the whip whip like with the commas and stuff like that and then when it comes to actually cutting it doesn't look like comma at all are you kidding me you have to like beat the thing three different times in order to get the, <laughs> to get the wheat down and then you've got to put it in the thing uh you know, you're not using two. You're not using two comma at the same right. time. You're grabbing yeah, something yeah. and then hacking at it. So, yeah. uh, my uh, my sensei used to tell me because he he lived a, he did a stint in Japan for about a year. I think he did the teaching English over there when he was younger. And he said he he watched someone with comma 
cut their just basically mow their lawn but it was they they you know they grab a chunk of grass and they literally just you know saw the grass and they're squatting down and they just grab a chunk and saw grab a chunk and saw and i was like that sounds so tedious but there's they still do it over there like that i guess i don't know well it's well and so what was interesting is that apparently the only machine they had to actually do this this stuff was something that cost like i don't know it was like 20 grand that they had to import from the uk oh wow incidentally its nickname was the gundam and i was like yes oh awesome yes <laughs> da, na, 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 na. and so um yeah so i was making a lot of obscure even japanese reference for japanese people references to that all day which was fun but yeah that that was my training for this week how about you <laughs> So actually, I want to. Ask, so, what what kind of comma did you use? So, I mean, do you have just some uh, stuff from the hardware store, basically, or do you use your? Yes, yes, that is that is basically uh, what I've got. Um, maybe show them on screen. So oh, this yeah. is the result of. Ooh, I mean, a nice sound, right? I don't want to cut anything accidentally. You can yeah. kind of see on there how it's not. Yeah. It is not a straight and uh, no I've competition got a or the fair. yeah I found that we've got like a um, Asian grocery store here in town and years and years ago I stopped in there to get some groceries and I saw they actually had they had like a little garden center and they had some comma and there's like oh well, I'm definitely buying those they're not they're not at all like they're not com commas that you want to train with but they're they're just they're cool to have and you know pull, go cut well, stuff I've, in your back I've got the nice like it's got the nice seal over it so it mm -hmm. makes it pretty much easy for me to do the training with it and whatnot yeah. so it's, yeah. i'm not too worried about like cutting myself um it's funny what, like i keep on hearing about live comma no don't do live comma comma no you need live weapons blah 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 just cover it like don't be stupid <laughs> yeah yeah i've i've been fortunate i have yet to cut myself with my comma my my sensei was not so lucky he's had several accidents uh in his early days slicing his leg open requiring stitches his head and he was using live comma with uh ropes so oh he, yeah and so he yeah he's had a few emergency room visits from from his comma training days that's um, intense that's like the kodosagama Karusig is not done frequently at all no no it's not and uh you know unfortunately it's one that i never really got around to learning he 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 sort of showed me a, a few things with them before he sort of retired from teaching mm. um and i really haven't kept up with it so anytime i do comma i'm still just using just the the nicho gamma um mm. i don't use ropes or anything with my with my kata so you know maybe one day i'll i'll delve back into that but haven't had a desire to slice my legs open so <laughs> well yeah i mean that that's just also how much of it did you feel that was for show? How much of that did you feel was this like it's tradition? How much of it do you feel that's like, okay, this could, if I actually got good at this, if I actually got my like dexterity down and whatnot, and my skill around w with it, I'd be actually be able to use it. Uh, most of it hit, uh, f from the way he was doing is mostly for show. I mean, I think the kata, he had a couple of kata that he would do with the, uh, with the comma with ropes and, um, they were contemporary kata. I don't know that they, they were not traditional mm. traditional kata in any way. So, I mean, I think they were stuff that he, when he was very, very young, he did maybe at tournaments and stuff like that. So, you know, they're more probably about flash than um, flash, dexterity, that sort of stuff than any kind of practicality. So um, that's probably another reason why I didn't really veer too much into them, just because I tend to be more practical with my Kobudo studies. And so I don't, do a lot of the the flowery fancy stuff with um with my weapons training yeah i i can't for the life of me i i, I cannot get around to and i guess this is why i've never been a master at it because i've always been a two-handed weapon kind of guy hmm. i've never been like even though i know it like bow it's just it's not i would never say it's not for me it's just something that like outside of one bokata that i know pretty well like mm -hmm. i've picked up three others uh, i can, can do kind of parts of them but i don't know them that mm -hmm. well i couldn't do them at all what's yeah. the what's the one that you know it's the keyhone version for the style that i learned um just creatively called bow keyhone uh so okay. uh which is really long 
mean, it repeats itself, but it's like really, really long. Does so, it repeat four directions? Um, no, it goes. Okay. The first one we teach is similar. Is similar, but it's it's really it's one of the longest ones we teach, but it's also the shortest because you're just repeating the same sequence, but you do it in all four directions. And it's essentially a fundamentals kata. You, that sounds like a smart thing to do. Our, the the one I do is more. Well, and and there was like some like kind of like complainy parts about like, you know, don't do it this way, do it this way, don't do it this way. And like, so the problem with that one was it was always like always changing, but it, it was kind of the, that's not Bo Kihon, I'm Bo Kihon. I'm, you're not Spider-Man, you're not spider Bo. I'm Spider-Bo. <laughs> like, like yeah. it, it's kind of that um, way, like on a basic thing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> There's a, I, you know, I, I, I found that I think there's more um, disparity or dis, disparity between versions of Kobudo Kata than there is empty handed Kata. I mean, you know, we were talking about Heian Pinons earlier. I mean, there's so many different versions of Pinon or Heian Shodan out there, but with Kobudo Kata, it's even more fragmented and you'll see stuff that has the same name, but bear absolutely no resemblance whatsoever. Um, to to anything so it's hard they're even harder to trace back one of the best things i heard about that was that the reason for that is marketing yeah the reason why you have so many sakagawa bows that do not look like each other at all is because everyone wants to be sakagawa bow yeah that explains it. I do three versions. I have three Sakagawa versions in my in our damn syllabus for Kobudo. I probably do one most of the time, but yeah, we have up to three. Yeah, but then it's like, do those all come from the same? Like, was that from the same line? Was that like Sakagawa Ichini San, or was that like, oh, is the Sakagawa from this person and the Sakagawa from this person, the Sakagawa from Sakagawa they're... really? Yeah, so I mean, they're they're supposedly all from Sakagawa, but they're 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 the way my sensei learned them was through different sort of different paths. So the lineage goes back to different sensei in terms of how he or where he learned them from. Um, so we have, we do a Sakagawa, no kun sho, no kun dai, and then no kun ko, so old version. Um, and uh, the dai, the dai and the ko version are very, very similar. There's like a couple movements that are different. And you know, sometimes I'm like, why, why bother? It's like, it's just like two, two moves that are different. Why do I need to keep three different kata? It's, we have, we have, our, our Kobudo syllabus probably has over 56 kata across all the different weapons. It's all, it's too much. It's too much. So I, I've even told my students nowadays, I'm like, you know what? I can't remember all these damn things. Um, so, you know, we'll focus on some of these here, uh, but mostly we, we, I try to focus just on the, 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 the practical application uh, and um, practical use of the weapons. And, you know, the kata are there as review, but um, yeah, trying to remember 56 kata, it's like, come on. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you don't need to, well, the thing is like, you need to have people, you need, I feel that was made when you either had like the savant who was just like a uh, human encyclopedia for that type of stuff. Yeah. But not everyone is that. That's no. impressive for damn sure, but like, that's not... Yeah, like it's way too much of anyone to ask, and like yep. not even close to like what anyone would tell you to do in any sort of like, uh, like I'm trying to think of like boxing or like baseball. Like I don't know, you don't learn like 57 p- different pitches, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, boxing sticks to the standard, you know, handful of techniques, and and that's it, right? So yeah, it is it is a lot. Um, and so the way, you know, the way my sense I used to justify having that many kata wasn't so much that, well, you need to know them all. It was more like, these are, you know, these are kind of like the old black and white pictures of your family that you don't want to get rid of, right? They are, they're, they're relics. They're things that you want to keep on your shelf and, you know, keep them nice and pretty and take care of them. Um, but if you stop doing them, then they sort of go away forever. Uh, so, you know, we, we keep them in the syllabus for their preservation, um, uh, for cataloging them, so to speak. Mm. But, you know, I probably only have a handful that I, I stick to that I consider like these are the kata that I do. Um, but, you know, just bow kata alone, I, I, I have 
at least 14 different builds. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. I can barely do one. <laughs> Yeah. I feel b- bad saying that because I've like got out of my way several times to be like, you know, when when you're at a seminar or like whatever, like you're training with somebody and they're like they really want to teach you a bow cut. I'm like, yeah, and like go out of your way, work on it hard during that day, you know, beg to take a video of that person, and then yeah. like you get home on the Monday and you're like, oh, I don't really remember that. And this video is like maybe I'll remember how to do it from the video and then sure, yeah. Yeah, that's always hard. That's always hard. <laughs> it's more of an emotional investment type of deal where it's like you feel bad because someone spent their time teaching you something and then sure. you don't really practice it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. But eh, it is what it is. What are they, like, so you have 17 bow kata. What are the other weapons you guys generally do? Um, so, I mean, we primarily focus on the, the core five. So we do bow, sai, tonfa, nunchaku, and kama. Um, and then once you get, uh, so we teach kobudo as its own system, its own syllabus, right? So we have, we're a little bit different where, you know, some, you know, there's people that are very, very diehard. Like you do not touch a weapon until you have a brown belt in karate or some sort of equivalent martial art, or you have to be a black belt before we start teaching a bow or side. Like I have, I have Kobudo students that have never taken a karate class in their life. They, they really, strictly, yeah, they only do Kobudo. So it's its own syllabus. You come in as a white belt, you're only learning bow. Um, and that yellow belt, you start learning Sai and you learn, you start learning your second bow kata. So you learn like one bow kata per belt. And then you gradually start adding more weapons and adding more kata as you progress. So uh, orange, so you're, you're starting bow at white belt. Uh, yellow belt, you're starting Sai, you continue with bow. At orange belt, you start learning Nunchaku, um, learn that first kata, and then you've got another Sai kata you're picking up, another bow kata. Uh, green belt, you're picking up Tonfa. Blue belt, you're picking up Kamas. And then once you're in the, the sort of the intermediate to advanced ranks, then you're picking up things like the Eku, the Nunte, Teiko, uh, Sertichin. So we do some of the, the little more, uh, I, I tend to call them more the exotic weapons that you know aren't really that standard. We do some of those at the upper levels as well. You guys do Nunji? Yep. Okay. Right on, right on. I've love hate relationship with Nunti. Mainly like with that and Aku because I can't get them. Yeah, like, you know, um, they're like impossible for me to get. Oh god. So to get this, Shiredo's uh at least in Okinawa is done making metal. Oh really? So I had this like window to get Nunti and I was like, I'll get it later, I'll get it later, and then like it's the Mr. T- it's the Homer wanting to meet Mr. T in the mall uh, from The Simpsons. He's like, "I'll go back a little later. I'll go back a little later." And then it's gone. Yep. Right. Um. So, yeah, you want at least for in the Okinawan part, you want Manji Sai? Nope. You want Nanti Nanti Bow? Nope. Wow. And Sai. Because it, it's not making up the majority of their business. The majority of their business is like geese uniforms yeah yeah and like sparring and like sparring gear and like figurines and like books yeah i had i i I used to have a pair of um charado side that i loved um and i i ended up basically giving those to one of my senior students when i got another pair that i'm not as happy with so one day i want to get another pair of charado side if i can ever find them or at least have just a pair that fits me better yeah um Apparently but, uh, they don't make them anymore. Yeah, I'll have to yeah, I'll have to find like someone else who can fabricate them. But uh, yeah, the Nunte, you know, like I I have a love hate relationship with the Nunte. Also, one I don't have a real one. I have one that somebody made. Like they took a straight bow, drilled a hole in the top, and shoved a manji sai in there. So it's incredibly clunky and not well balanced, and you know it's heavy as hell. Uh, so you know if you're running through a kata with it, it's like you're you're gassed out because this thing is just a beast to swing. So I would love to find a Nunte someday that is actually, you know, properly made, well balanced and, you know, get to do something with it. So, you know, I don't play with my Nunte all that often just because I hate using that damn thing. <laughs> well, if you want a balance challenge uh, and you want to, you want to meet a very uh, cantankerous old man who lives in New Jersey, um, <clears throat> you can go to my dad's house and get my, my Aku. <laughs> Um, it's made of like coca bolo. It's mm. weird, 
completely made it's not it's like basically made to be like a bow but it's too big it's probably too heavy but i think feel like for you like that would be like a balance challenge and like oh, a weight challenge now so. my aku, I, I have I have a nice aku. I have a custom made aku that I think is made out of purple heart wood or something. I got that. I think they don't. They're not around anymore. There used to be a custom weapon maker called Crane Mountain. Oh uh, yeah, Crane. Yeah, so I have a, I have an aku from there. But Nunte, yeah, my Nunte is just terrible to use. <laughs> just terrible. Yeah, I, I are they supposed to have a broad down the middle? I I honestly don't know. I've yeah. I've literally never seen one that is you know sort of properly made so i i don't know um i i funnily enough i have a i have a student who loves to i mean he's he's a craftsman so i mean he built he, he made me a nice bow out of uh, ipe wood he, he can make anything and he's like if you want me to make a nunte i'll make a nunte just tell me how it's supposed to be made i'm like i don't know how it's supposed to be made like i've never seen one <laughs> but you know you can maybe find something out on the interwebs who knows well, it's like, and this is the biggest why everyone's like Japan, like Okinawa martial arts is the is the advanced uh, Japanese martial arts. Like now, Japanese martial arts like are like overly, overly, overly detailed in like several different ways, to the point where like they tell you how to fold a hakama like five different ways, right? Yeah. Okinawa martial arts, on the other hand, is just like, yeah, we got this from somewhere. His dad <laughs> knows something about it. Uh, yeah. It's not to insult Okinawa martial arts. It's just literally like, yeah. I was trying to explain that to my my that 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 particular student one time because he was he's going to be making he's he's trying to make some taiko for me, mm -hmm. and he's like, well, how how do you want these made? And he's asking all these questions because he wants to be very accurate and precise. And he's like, well, how are these usually made in Okinawa? I'm like, well, they're not really like. I mean, they just used what they had, right? They didn't mm -hmm. really have like the taiko store that they went to where they could just buy these things. You know, I mean. The most of the, yeah really most of the you know the okinawan uh, arsenal is just whatever they had lying around and that's what you used um so there's not like a standard way to make these things like you, so you know it's figured out i guess <laughs> it's yeah. yeah i can't well, really give you much to go on well it's like they had glaives they had like naginatas they had swords too there's sure. yeah. there's there is a very very short list of people who actually do like quote-unquote okinawan sword um when like okinawa and naginata but right. it's a jigenru no jigenru jigenru is japanese but jigenru was taught in okinawa i think right it was because it was from, from kagoshima and kagoshima would like that was their biggest that, those were the guy everyone's like japan went down to okinawa yeah, okay japan and like was not japan in like 18, 1865 okay like, right yep that was the sasuma sendai had gone down because i used to live Basically, the islands right above Okinawa caught all of those guys first before they went to Okinawa. Yep. And interestingly enough, like they went down there and they actually like it wasn't just like dudes hanging out on a boat for like two or, f or like two months or whatever. And like, we'll just kind of like conquest around there. They weren't pirates. It was a political right. invasion. Right, so right. what they did is they went down to these islands above them, the Amami Islands. And like changed people's names literally said your name is this now your name is that now yeah um, and like very specifically uh made sure it was kind of rooted there so they couldn't like go up and they couldn't work get the chinese and their side yeah we went into a historical discussion <laughs> kind of out of nowhere <laughs> that's but... all right that's all right but yeah. these guys the uh, cheesy combo have always mm, been nice I don't know how much you've seen of these guys. Um, I have a pair. Um, it's that doesn't have ropes though. It has. Uh, it just has. It has a actual carved out hole for the for the fingers uh, in the wood. Um, but I, I I'll use them. I'll use them as taiko. Um, so I'll do like maizeto no taiko with the chizu kunbo if if uh, if that's all I have handy. If I don't have my taiko available. Mm. Yeah, everyone's called them taiko, but they're they. How I was always taught to use them was moving them around like freely like that. Mm -hmm. You never, they were never supposed to just be like have the like kind of stiff hand. Yep. It, do you feel that Taiko is more stiff handed? Uh, 
sometimes I tend to use them more for uh, augmenting and um, enhancing just the, the, the grappling. So a lot of what I'm doing, like a lot of the applications out of like my and Tenko, which is really the only Tenko kata that I know, um, it's, it's a lot of grabbing and seizing limbs. So, you know, when you've got the Tenko in your hand, it's it's enhancing and, you know, making those uh, those seizing techniques much more painful. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's sort of the approach that I take with them. Do you feel people would question whether or not they could actually use them? Like, actually, like, it's like, I have a pair of Tenko in my back pocket. Kaham. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. I tend, I, I, I actually, I'll, I'll sort of compare them sometimes to brass knuckles. Mm. And so, you know, they can, they can be sort of used in a similar capacity as that. And when I, when I usually, when I say, well, they're like brass knuckles, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe I could see using that, you know, to, to punch someone if I needed to. But, you know, let's certainly skip. I'm curious, I want to go back to something you said before was, how you run the Kobodo in your school is almost completely different from karate or is a completely separate school from karate. You have students in Kobodo that aren't in karate. And it was like, who are those people? I'm not being like, who does that? But it's, it, it's always, I've always seen it just merge. And I've never yeah. heard of anyone actually saying that. And so I'm interested, not that like, I wouldn't you to disclose anything about your students, but like, no, no. like, who how does that conversation start is it people who want to just learn weapons is it just people yeah who are like usually yeah so i mean a couple of the you know so one of my senior students who's been with me for a long time um at least over a decade uh he joined us when he was very young because he saw i did a i think i was doing a kobudo demonstration on campus uh at one point and uh he happened to be in the audience and then after the demonstration he looked us up and said i would love to learn weapons so he's now a weapons student um yeah most people find us just by you know i, I don't know they're out there searching for they want to learn weapons or they've got an affinity for learning weapons and they they reach out to us and um you know it's 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 definitely one of our smaller classes you know it's not it's never been um you know the class that uh you know, everybody sort of flocks to um it it it's it attracts a, it definitely attracts a certain personality type i don't know how i would describe it um you know i get all kinds of people that come in to try that class from the people who have you know been watching anime all their life and they think they know how to use sai and then they get in class and they realize this is nothing like what i thought i'd be learning um to people who you know just they think weapons are cool and they want to try learning them and so they they start coming and yeah it's it's pretty interesting it's definitely a different um yeah definitely a different personality type in the kobudo class for the for the people who just do strictly kobudo um you know i've got maybe only two students who do both karate and kobudo huh. and i've got another one who does he does karate he does kobudo and he also does iaido so he kind of does the the trifecta <laughs> depending on what well yeah, that and that's like because I guess do you feel the IEIDA would have to kind of round that out? Because there's a lot of people who will base the Kobodo strictly base the Kobodo on like attack of sword. Right? Yeah. And like so, a sword attack and everything yeah. is based on that. Which Yeah, so I, I don't do that. Um I but I, I I'm familiar with, with that sort of mentality where, you know, you're your Sai are for blocking a samurai sword and, and, and everyone, you know, I, I don't study Iaido, but all of our Iaido sense would be like, you would never in a million years want to try to catch a downward cut from a samurai sword with a Sai. You are, you're just, that's about the stupidest thing in the world you could do. Um, but yet that's one of those things that has one of those sort of romantic kind of, I don't know, rumors that has you know perpetuated throughout history and people think oh these are you know not only did you plant seeds with your sai but then when the samurai came and attacked you you could use it to block their sword and so like as i said earlier you know i try to implement some practicality into the the kobudo that i teach so most of the time i'm trying to teach through the context of you know the historical premise that these things a lot of these things were used was you know the sai the bow you know there were tools that the um the, the paging class would have, would have carried, you know, with a, mm. law enforcement for better or for worse, right? 
Um, so the, for domestic security. So, you know, when we're looking at applications from the different movements with the Psy, it's like, okay, well, this, these could be possibly grappling or, or movements to arrest someone, right? They're not necessarily because you've got the samurai across from you and you're sparring with them, you know, deflecting sword swipes. So when we do a lot of our partner work with the Psy, for example, um, we will do stuff against the bow. Uh, we will do stuff against Psy against Psy. Um, but then we will also do like, uh, I will give them just a giant stick you know, try to try to um, work with, you know, what the average untrained person might do if they were to just pick up a random stick and start swinging at you. You are, you know, now needing to defend yourself and what options do you have with you, do you have available to you with the Psy? Um, but, you know, not likely, it's not likely that that person would have had a samurai sword. Now, you know, if we look back historically, you know, Okinawa, being a, a busy port that it was, you know, with, with um, people coming in from China and uh, the, all over, you know, there were pirates, marauders, for better or for worse, uh, or if you want to use that word. And um, so, you know, it was quite likely you were facing, they were facing swords of some kind, but it wasn't, it wasn't a romantic idea. Yeah. It wasn't the fighting off an army of samurai with your, with your side, your bow on your, you know, bow on your hip. Yeah. No. So, so I try. I try to introduce some 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 practicality, some more realistic perspectives on how how we do the kobudo. And so you know the people who do iaido as well, they sort of understand that we have kind of a running joke in our dojo where, you know, they call us the peasants, and then they're the the aristocrats with their their swords. So, <laughs> I mean, that's not far away. I mean, it's like it's interesting. It's like yeah, you have the 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 gentry of of. Yeah. The, the 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 fancy lad fencers and then you have like bad boys like okinawa right yeah. you know they you're just learning to, <laughs> to police with these weapons yeah which just makes me think about current times it's like well what if we you know if we're we're talking about all of that not to get political or anything but it's like yeah just just reintroduce this to the police force sure like, yeah. <laughs> just take one thing away and give them another and then you know yeah, there's a really, um, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's a really great book by uh, Andreas Kraskas. Um, I can't remember how to pronounce his last name. So. I think I know who you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, um, but I think it's called A Stroll Along Ryukyu's uh, Martial Arts History. Um, it's a really cool book. It's got a lot of different anecdotes in there and different um, stories that he's, he's found and translated. And one of them, I can't remember what particular uh, sensei it was talking about, but it said, you know, he heard he he was he was working as law enforcement at the time, and uh, he had got word that there was a riot breaking out at the market in town in Okinawa. And he grabbed his bow and he went down and he broke up the riot. There's no other details given. It's just saying that he grabbed his bow and he went down to the market to you know disperse the riot. And I, and I you know when I hear stuff like that, I'm thinking like, all right, so what would he have done? You know, would he have just gone in there and started swinging his bow or what? What would he have done if someone attacked him? You know, he's not going down to face an army of samurai. It's it's peasants, it's merchants, you know, that sort of stuff. And so what would he have been dealing with? And that is the sort of thing that, you know, the Okinawan bow or the, the, the kata that we're doing is sort of used is is for, right? It's not, these aren't battlefield techniques. They're not, this is not, you know, warfare techniques. Um, so, you know, we try to look at it through that perspective. I'm just thinking like that's like the worst police report ever. <laughs> <laughs> it is think about it like this is like yeah there's a riot down down by in tamari so we had to go you know grab yep. the bow broke it up yep Take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's that like we we can speculate on like technique all day long it's like yep. probably wasn't all i mean because you have to think about and th this is something something i never really heard much about where it's like dealing with knives and dealing with deal like how those guys would probably deal with knives would be with sai hmm. possibly um, yeah. or like even even just you using a longer range weapon to kind of keep keep people at bay so they don't have to deal with a knife sure um but in, in most of this practice it does not that doesn't come up too much but so it's really interesting to hear that you teach cuz I, I didn't know that until you said it um that you teach a completely separate course of study mm -hmm. that's completely outside of karate mm -hmm. where people just learn weapons so yeah, yeah. it's 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 um i've never 
I, I've not really met anybody else who, or talked to anybody else who does it that way. Um, and it's always the way it was done since I've been with my dojo for, you know, over 20 some years. Um, so, you know, in my sense, I always said like, Hey, if someone wants to learn, I'm going to teach them. You know, I, I don't care if they've never had a, a karate class before. Now, obviously if you have experience or you are also studying, you know, an empty handed art, you're going to have some advantages over someone who's doing purely weapons. Right. I mm. mean, um, stances, like how do you, how would you like teach stances in the beginning? Like is stance work going to be, because it's, you're just doing kata, but I mean, or you're not just doing kata. You're also trying to throw application in there. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Which we is, do stances. We do kihon. Yeah, yeah. So they're learning stances. They're, they're learning all the standard stances that I teach in my karate class. So Zen Kutsubachi, front stance, back stance, all that stuff. You know, mm. I teach all those things. And you know, the, 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 the folks who, who have done karate already or have some experience, you know, they pick up that stuff a little bit quicker than the ones who haven't. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just takes them a little longer, but they, they pick it up just fine. But then actually like saying like, no, we're not just doing kata. We're also going to learn like practical technique. We're actually going to practice it. Yep. And then you throw this old mace stuff in there. Then it's like, you get a real, <laughs> but you get, you get like a real thing because then you see a lot of people who just teach kata. And I've discussed this with some people recently where it's been either like, yeah, only do like the short handed stuff. Don't try to do like the long stuff is just for show too. Oh, it's just relics. They're just relics. They're just tradition. Don't worry about yeah. them too much. Yeah, yeah. And so like to actually hear somebody do, doing that. Yeah. Yeah. When we'll like, do, uh, we actually, we'll spar, yeah, we'll spar with, uh, with our weapons. So, uh, just the other day we had them doing some bow sparring. We don't put on gear or anything, but we keep it controlled. And, um, it's, it's funny. I was remembering my, um, you know, back when I was a, a, a Q rank learning Kobudo and my sensei would say, you know, if you ever watch someone do their bow kata and they keep opening their hands a lot when they're making their strikes, that tells you they've never had somebody else striking their bow while they're making that because you will knock their bow out of their hands if they keep opening it up. And so, what, and it's and it's true because it's, it's an easy habit to get into, but the second you have someone spar somebody else who's got a bow, you know, it only takes a few times getting your bow knocked out of your hand before you realize like, oh, I need to hold on to this thing and, you know, keep my arms strong. Otherwise I'm going to lose my weapon. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we do, we do uh, a fair bit of sparring um, and application work. We teach, you know, you got to learn how to roll and how to fall with your weapon so you don't puncture yourself or something. So uh, yeah, we try to keep it as, as uh, practical as possible. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So what do you got going on this week in terms of like, goals training classes um, stuff like that yeah not uh so we're we're getting right now I'm, I'm kind of focusing on um sort of figuring out what we're gonna do with our space or we're at the time of year where i'll typically get asked by our landlord if we're gonna be sticking around another year um so i'm that's you know, always fun yeah i'm kind of wrestling with the uh, decisions of do we stay here and try to risk another year during the pandemic where i mean we've we've been okay we've been stable but uh you know rent's going up and all that so it's like all right maybe we should look at maybe moving so that's sort of been um at the forefront of my my focus as far as the dojo goes but i'm still getting in you know uh several times a week and putting in a few hours um as far as focus uh, on my training, um, I've been working a lot lately on uh, Goju Shiho Dai um, in our syllabus. It's one that, you know, I hadn't done in a while and just for whatever reason just felt like uh, kind of relearning it in a sense. And so I've been, I've been playing a lot with that kata lately. Um, but also, you know, I found, um, I think Dan and I might have talked this about, about this one time, you know, I don't really... I don't spend a whole lot of time running kata in their entirety anymore. I like just picking different sections and working on, you know, getting those things really, really well performed and then work on the actual applications for them. And then, you know, maybe I'll put it all together in one, the actual sequence, but mm -hmm. for the most part, I don't do a whole lot of kata in its entirety anymore. Yeah, I, I, I would think, because especially when you have stuff like Goju Shiho and Chinto, on mm -hmm. in your bracket which i had a jinto in my bracket at one point but goju shiho is one of those ones where i'm like maybe someday <laughs> like it's just long yeah it's just yeah long. it is long i mean it's it's like it's like your like final boss kata <laughs> and, and 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 or like that's why people are like it's your black belt kata because it's the longest one um or whatever um and and yeah i i can see doing that because 
one, you're going to get more out of it doing it that way than just con- it's like focusing on one note, of, one part of a song when doing it well, rather than doing the whole thing badly. Yeah, sure. And yeah. actually being able to get something out of it rather than, okay, yeah. we did it. Mm-hmm. Good job. Good job, everyone. It would be uh it would be an interesting topic for a future discussion, maybe because if we got into it now, it would take it a whole other hour or more. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, so there is this, and this ties back to oh, you know, teaching Kobudo separately, and like I said, some some purists would say don't ever teach anybody weapons until they got a black belt, whatever. Um, but keeping you know, making people wait until they're a certain rank before they learn a kata. I don't necessarily do that anymore either. If someone is a purple belt and they want to learn some black belt level kata, like I'm happy to teach it to them. They're going to run mm-hmm. it like crap and it's going to look like a purple belt running an a very advanced kata. But, you know, I don't really keep secrets and or I don't really hold those things back from people. If they really want to learn something, I'll, I'll teach it to them. But I've also been in dojos where that's not the case. Like if you are a purple belt, you do not dare try to do a kata that is, you know, later on in the syllabus and you will be given many push-ups if you you know are seen doing that and <laughs> yeah so it's it's i i think that's an interesting i think it's an interesting uh discussion for some yeah, time possibly yeah. because yeah I, i've just gotten to where you know there's no secrets here if you want to learn it i'll teach it to you uh, i'm never i'm not gonna ask you to do it at a test or anything but you know nothing wrong with you playing around with it it's yeah well actually like and and it's like it's the difference between like saying to like a beginning runner it's like yeah you can run five miles if you want to rather you just do one be good at it (laughs) but yeah yeah, sure exactly go run five miles go ahead right knock yourself out maybe doing five miles will get you better at the one mile but it's so weird how because the the other thing is like all right well apparently this sensei has never heard of this little website called youtube where like like you know where like (laughs) which where Sal has a many, many good, uh, good a video there. Um, you know, like it's just, you can't keep secrets because the only, like if, if people are like, we need to keep this kind of hidden away from the public eye. Right. Sure. Like, yeah. cause yeah, that's yeah, yeah. going to keep people from knowing your secrets. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm sure a lot of that, I'm sure a lot of that mentality is sort of that pre-internet age of, you know, keep being able to hold those secrets. But yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll have students come in and say, hey, I, I, I'm, I started learning such and such kata because I saw a YouTube video. I'm like, all right, that's great. Um, you know, we can run through it sometime so we can address maybe some of the minor differences because every kata, every dojo does a kata slightly different. Um, and, you know, I'm always, I always tell people like, there's gonna be things that are cosmetically different, um, but I'm more, I'm more focused on their core movement and how they're moving their body. So. Mm. You know, if your knife hand's here instead of being here or something like, you know, it's it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, I've always been all for like letting students explore and yeah, you want to learn a different kind of go for it. You only have, you only, I'm only going to ask you to do the following things, but you know, go do what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, um, hopefully you don't have to get on that Zillow anytime soon and keep, <laughs> keep your space, but uh, cool. Yeah, um, I hope not. Um, probably going to look at... Uh, probably going to look at finding a place where I can just rent by the hour because I mean we're we for the the number of hours that we actively offer classes where we currently are it's probably mm-hmm. you know maybe twelve hours a week um, you know we only teach in the evenings so okay. our place our place sits empty and unused you know eighty percent of the day um, and we pay eighteen hundred dollars a month so I'm like that this isn't this doesn't make good business sense we need to probably just either find some way to fill those empty time slots or um which i'm not going to do like I, I'm, I'm never going to go to teach full time and and try to make a living off of that i don't make any i don't make any money from the teaching that i do um but i can go to another place and just pay for the 10 hours that we are there a week and you know not have to charge students as much yeah and i mean like that's a whole other discussion on its own but yeah that that's one of the reasons why i've never been able to i've maybe one day like if i re- when i retire but i not until that time um what am i saying i'm never gonna retire <laughs> <laughs> what is this retirement but uh yeah hopefully i hope that works out man but that's a oh, that, is, yeah. that is not a that is not a, a 
position I'm, I'm I've seen others go into uh, mm -hmm. quickly and then kind of burn through. But it looks like he had something there for a while. But is also like landlords being crappy, and I've seen the remains of that when it didn't go right. Yeah. So, yep, yep. yep. Cool, cool. Well, we'll wrap things up here. Uh, thank all everyone right. for watching, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you all on the flip side. Thank you.